Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all. Thank you for joining the transition to clean cooking webinar series hosted by the Clean Cooking Alliance, the World Health Organization, as part of the Health and Energy Platform of Action activities. Today's webinar is focused on how behavioral science can help increase uptake and sustained use of clean energy in developing countries. We'll be hearing from colleagues from the World Bank, Green Light Planet, and the Clean Cooking Alliance about the important role that behavior plays in the adoption of clean cooking solutions. We'll have the opportunity to hear results from assessments completed in six, seven here in African countries, as well as a group of panelists and, 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 their, and their perspectives and, and, and how they see the role of behavior science and the work around clean cooking that they do. For that, I would like to welcome our first spe uh, speaker, first speaker, Pirel Apache. Pirel Apache is the practice manager of the African region, the poverty and equity global practice of the World Bank. Pirela has a head technical, held technical, operational, and management positions, and she has been instrumental in developing the corporate agenda on poverty and inequality, jobs and gender. She holds a PhD in economics from the Victoria University of Manchester and has written extensively in the areas of inequality, poverty, labor, gender, and human development. Over to you. Thanks very much, Heather. And so I, I really don't see my role so much as a speaker, but rather as just an introdu introducing the speakers, because I, I really think this is a great opportunity for us to actually hear about uh, the results of a really important sort of um, initiative and collaboration across different GPs in an area that is really quite key to development generally, but particularly to poverty reduction and child prosperity, which is one of the objectives we're trying to achieve. I think what I think is really important about this exercise, I suppose, is three areas. The first one is the multi-dimensional, multi multi, multi-GP aspect of the project itself, because it really is a cooperation of the poverty GP and particularly the embed team. And I will say, be saying something about that in a second. But, uh, and, uh, and obviously the, a number of other G GPs uh, that came together. Uh, it's, it's particularly is financed by the um, CDEV in the climate group and the SPAN, so it's, uh, which actually has really been working on the issue of climate change and particularly sort of um, clean energy for a long time. So why is this important? This is, as I said, the reason why I think the second part reason why this is important is that a clean energy and access to clean energy in particular is definitely sort of a key component of the rebuilding back, building back better. Uh, and in particular, the sustainability of growth and recovery going forward after COVID. Um, and uh, I think the third part of what we're going to hear that is new and somehow important, innovative, is the use of behavioral science. And over the last few years, Embed, which is part of the poverty uh, global practice, has actually been working within the bank to bring the social, social, uh, sorry, <laughs> behavioral aspects to, to social development generally, but also to economic development more broadly, by sort of basically uh, increasing the ability of delivering effective solutions at, at country level. I think that's it's been, up in, in used in a number of different sectors and a number of different applications. And I think this, the, the, the clean energy, um, it's a particularly, I suppose, uh, uh, interesting one, because as I say, there's an area that where we usually, pov as poverty people don't necessarily work, but also where there is a lot of scope to actually address important barriers that seem to be emerging to, to, to basically using a solution that seems to be sort of an important solution for everybody, but, you, there, but at the same time, seem to be a lot of barriers to, to, to the use of that this, this solution at country level. So I think uh, it's, quite, it's quite an important area to try to address those barriers, the existing barriers on the behavioral side uh, in a way that it's innovative. And this is what we're going to see. Uh, so um, I'm not going to go, as I said, a lot more on the details because I think there is a lot of material coming up. We have a presentation that is going to take about 30 minutes. And then I think 
a number of other um, uh, speakers will come up, other discussants, so, and I'm hoping we'll have a very, very interesting uh, Q and A ses session to follow. So um, uh, I actually think the only other thing for me remaining for me to do is really just to introduce the speakers. And the speakers are Samantha De Martino, who is an, ec an economist in the BAT team, which I just spoke about a second ago. And uh, Sam has uh, a PhD in economics from the University of Sussex in the UK. The other speaker is Joanna um, Lorenzka. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And she's a behavioral science also in the MBAC team and has a PhD in cognitive studies from the University of Warwick, also in the UK. So as I say, for me, I think I finish here and I let some uh, Johanna, uh, Johanna take, the, take the floor. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Perella. All right, so to, uh, hi, my name is Samantha, and today we'll be discussing findings from behavioral diagnostics, mapping into feasible and low cost solutions um, for the adoption of clean energy across six sub Saharan African countries. So before we get into it, um, uh, we're going to start with a short icebreaker to get warmed up. So I'm going to show you a few statements and uh, I'd like you to type true in the Q&A box if you consider the statement to be true. Otherwise, please type false in the Q&A box if you consider the statement to be false. Um, the Zoom um, chat function and Q&A function is disabled for others to see each other's responses. So I will um, be letting you know what the uh, or false to this statement. All right, so we are saying uh, um, pretty much all truth. All right, so now the second statement is, I eat healthy, I sleep well, and exercise regularly. So please type either true or false in here. Okay, so here we have a bit of a mix, but the majority is saying false. All right. Second set, it is good to create a savings goal for a future large expense. Overwhelming amount of truth to the statement. And the corresponding statement, I always create and follow through with a long-term savings plan for large expenses. <laughs> There's some falses with sad faces as well as emojis. Um, so what this simple exercise illustrates is what we call the intention to action gap. So the first, um, many considered the first statement, which is more referring to an intention or belief to be true. Um, but when the second statement popped up, which is more related to an action, many responded false. Uh, so why do we have this gap between what we intend or believe uh, to want to do and what we actually do in our actions or behaviors? Um, there's a series of behavioral bottlenecks that drive this gap. Um, some have to do with uh, self-control or lack of commitment devices, um, among sev several others. And we'll get into this um, a bit more deeply because this was one of the behavioral bottlenecks that we uncovered. Uh, in our work. So the agenda today will very briefly discuss the behavioral science approach and the policy challenge that we applied it to, um, how we collected behavioral data across the countries, and then the main findings from uh, the clean uh, uptake and sustained use clean, for clean cooking and solar home systems, and then conclude uh, before going into the panelist discussion. So the behavioral framework, um, so coming from the World Development Report in 2015, Mind, Society, and Behavior, which essentially um, was coming from the point of view that traditional policy may ignore the powerful psychological and social influences on behavior when individuals, households, policymakers make decisions. Um, this framework allows 
um, us to rethink uh, how people and individuals in society uh, make decisions. So essentially it falls into three buckets. One, we think automatically. So we rely on mental shortcuts. Um, we make thousands of decisions on a daily basis and it's possible to make cost benefit rational uh, analysis decisions at every uh, second in these um, thousands of micro decisions that we make. So we need to rely on mental shortcuts often. We think socially. Uh, we live in a social environment. We're influenced by those around us, either consciously or subconsciously, and that also informs our decision-making behavior. And finally, we think with mental models. So what does this mean? It means we take our both shared experience in the past and our own personal past experience, which filters the information that we allow in to then make future decisions or decisions in the present. So applying this to the development uh, challenge today is the energy access crisis, specifically in the Sub-Saharan Africa region. When we look just at electricity access, so for the solar home system agenda, Today, 75% of those across the globe without access to electricity live in Sub-Saharan Africa. And tomorrow by IEA projections, this will grow to 80%. So the population in Sub-Saharan Africa will grow from 600 million to 630 million without access. When we look at clean cooking, 83% without access to clean cooking live in Sub-Saharan Africa. So this means they rely on traditional fuels such as firewood. And tomorrow, this number of 890 million will grow to more than 1 billion without access. So the main takeaway from this slide is that essentially the traditional policy levers that are in place um, will barely, if even, keep up with population growth as we move towards 2030. So why apply behavioral science to this challenge? Uh, first, it's a new approach of many needed to shift the needle on these projections and, and especially on at least five of the SDGs which, affect it, which are affected either directly or indirectly um, by 2030 of this challenge. Uh, second, technology advances often require, if not at least assume, some form of behavior change re regarding the purchase and then sustained use of that technology. So this goes, you know, in all cases of technology, whether it's um, solar home systems or um, computers. So without addressing constraints and behavior, technology advances may never fully realize their potential impact. Uh, in our literature review, we found that there is not yet a systematic application of behavioral science to the clean energy challenge in developing countries. So this programmatic activity, um, we applied a cross-country approach using a behavioral policy lens to look within and across context at the bottlenecks um, affecting the uptake and sustained use of clean energy in developing countries with a focus on Sub-Saharan Africa. We uncovered underlying biases, norms, and mental models that have been working against the adoption of these two main technologies which have uh, brought a greater understanding to then how to minimize or overcome these barriers with low cost and effective solutions that can be scalable and sustainable to help reach better outcomes. Now I'll turn to Joanna. Great, thank you, Sam. Um, here we go, perfect. Um, so to identify bottlenecks for the adoption of both solar home systems and clean cook stoves, we carried out behavioral diagnostic, relying mainly on qualitative uh, data collection in the six countries. We covered adopters, non-adopters, as well as suppliers, uh, and we used a mix of approaches to data collection. Uh, namely, in four of the countries, we relied on semi-structured interviews, focus groups, and marketplace observations. Um, however, due to COVID, we actually had to adjust data collection in the, the other two countries. That was um, for uh, Ghana you know, when it came to cooking and for Senegal when it came to solar. So in this case, we actually relied on semi-structured interviews, which were carried out uh, over the phone. 
Um, so this meant that we had to adjust uh, the instruments as well as the protocols for data collection, um, which was a bit challenging considering the qualitative no nature. But all in all, we were able to conclude the work and we covered around 300 participants uh, across the six countries. Um, so in terms of the remote data collection per se, this proved uh, successful. So what you can see in the screen is uh, some of uh, examples of the, the, the solar home benefits that were identified uh, as part of uh, the field work that we did in Senegal. Uh, and here, as you can see, we were able to get a good level of uh, detail and elaboration. And beyond benefits such as safety or education, um, we were able to pinpoint other uh, valued benefits, such as, uh, for example, benefits to income generation activities. Uh, so this quote provides a nice illustration. Um, so also at night, I sell coffee and porridge. And again, without light, my business is plate. The candle cannot hold with the wind blowing. So this kind of information then becomes pretty valuable when we're thinking of designing communication that really aligns with benefits that are valued by potential users uh, to increase adoption. Okay, so turning now to the main findings, we'll start with uh, clean cooking. Um, and we cover that in three countries. That was Ghana, Madagascar, and Huanga. And I'm gonna guide you through uh, the findings of the work that we did in Huanga. So in Huanga, we were focusing on the adoption of an improved uh, pellet cook stove. Uh, in Huanda, most households actually cook with uh, biomass as the primary energy source. Uh, and in rural areas, this tends to be uh, mainly firewood. Uh, we also know that there's around 22% of households in rural areas that have uh, an ICS. Now, a big problem in uh, Huanda, but also in other countries is deforestation and uh, clean cooking using uh, traditional stoves is a big contributor to this. So as part of the work, as I mentioned, we did qualitative data collection, but we also relied on the analysis of available administrative data. That included uh, supplier data as well as available uh, survey data. In terms of uh, the field work itself, uh, we focus on two rural areas and one peri-urban district. Uh, we targeted low-income households uh, with and without uh, the improved cook stove or ICS. Uh, and the focus was on the main uh, person responsible for the cooking in the household. We covered a number of topics, as you can see on the screen, including community norms in terms of uh, uptake of uh, the, the ICS, but also things like preferences, values, behaviors around what is cooked, who cooks, how it's cooked, uh, among others, as you can see on the screen. Okay, so let me now turn uh, to, to the findings and I will guide you through these uh, by using the, the user journey that we uncovered uh, through the data collection we did. Uh, so on the left side of the screen, you can see Binta. Uh, and in order uh, for Binta to uh, adopt the ICS, Binta must follow a number of actions and steps along the way. Um, uh, actions and decisions along the way, sorry. So along these uh, steps, Binto can face uh, bottlenecks to, to adoption. And I'm gonna take you through uh, some of the bottlenecks we uncovered as part of the field work. So Binto must first learn and become interested in the household. Um, but what we learned was that there was this biased cost perception in terms of the fuel use. Um, so this quote illustrates it well. So I saw how the pellets burned it. Uh, how much money can I be wasting? Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we were focusing on the adoption of uh, an ICS stove that was uh, using pellets as a fuel. And because pellets uh, burn uh, very quickly, visible, uh, there was this perception that they were being wasted very quickly. It was like burning uh, money in a way. Now, even if Binta uh, becomes interested, uh, then she needs to save uh, for uh, the cook stove, um, which traditionally is needed for these low-income uh, households. Um, and then as the next step in the journey, once she purchases the cook stove, she must then use it as the main cooking source. Uh, and here, um, the field work revealed that the big barrier for this was the actual uh, cooking uh, norms uh, in terms of 
um, for example, specifically beans. So beans are um, a household staple in, in Huenda. However, the norm is to actually slow cook the dry beans uh, using the traditional stove. Uh, so if you soak the beans, you can actually cut down the cooking speed uh, substantially by like 50%. Uh, but the households we spoke uh, with, they really were not aware of this practice, nor of the time or fuel savings that it could bring. There was also uh, this belief that ICS was uh, suitable mainly for quick cooking tasks, uh, such as uh, heating water, uh, particularly because of the fuel uh, spending. Now, after this step, Binta needs to teach other people in her household so that we avoid stove stacking or the use of multiple stoves when Binta is not away. Uh, and here, the, the field work uncovered an interesting dynamic in, in the household. Uh, so there was this low, uh, uh, this, this perception on a low ability in terms of domestic workers uh, to operate the, the stove, uh, which was seen as basically a high skill activity. Uh, so it turns out that uh, in Huanda, uh, most households actually have uh, a domestic worker, uh, and this is common across all income uh, uh, levels. Uh, however, uh, what came up very uh, strongly was that uh, there was this um, perception from the side of the, the female heads of households uh, that the domestic workers lack the skills to use the ICS. Uh, as you can see in this quote, we most, mostly use it ourselves. We fear that house helpers can waste pellet, burn the food, or damage uh, the stove. So I gave you, uh, I illustrated some of the barriers we uncovered, and all these barriers along the way can really impair adoption if not tackle. Uh, so that's really the next uh, phase of uh, what we're doing. So as part of this work, we also identified potential behavioral solutions to overcome these, these barriers, which we'll be testing as part of phase two of the project. So let's look at some of these. Focusing uh, first on uh, this issue of how to increase bean soaking by household cooks. Uh, so one of the things we know from the behavioral uh, literature is that messengers are important. So if you observe a trusted uh, individual doing a given behavior, that can really make that behavior more attractive. So a possible solution here would be to use uh, community role models or influencers uh, to demonstrate that behavior of bean soaking. Uh, that would also be a way to uh, increase the salience over the fuel uh, um, savings, but also of the quicker uh, cooking time. Um, so interestingly, uh, in, in our field work, uh, another thing that came up was that uh, this quicker cooking speed was actually a really, really a valued be benefits among um, household heads because they value this extra time to, for example, do extra, uh, do other cores, or have more time uh, in the evening helping their kids and so forth. Uh, another potential solution is the use of gamification, uh, such as promoting communal tasting competitions. Uh, and here that could be a winning prize for the best uh, bean soaked recipe. Uh, this could, for example, be uh, having the recipe published in the local newspaper uh, with the cook's image. Um, so this would be a way to leverage social learning and the diffusion of information among peers in the community while making the behavior attractive. And then another possibility to promote this behavior at the household level uh, would be to try and build the habit of bean soaking by pairing it uh, with an existing uh, routine behavior. Uh, for instance, um, bean soaking uh, could be paired as, as part of the activities that are done in the evening uh, to cook uh, one's meal. Okay, so turning now um, briefly to some of the solutions uh, to really increase ICS use by domestic workers to re reduce this, this stove stacking. Um, so as I mentioned, there was this low um, confidence in their ability to use the stove. And another thing that um, uh, household heads often mentioned was that they didn't have the time uh, to actually teach or um, oversee the domestic workers. Uh, so here a possibility would be 
um, to use uh, role models. So mainly uh, having the training on how to use the ICS, but having that delivered by a duo of the female household head uh, and a domestic worker. Uh, this could act to counteract this belief that they are not capable because of this modeling, uh, but also uh, it would be a way to demonstrate positive interactions. Uh, like the um, domestic worker providing tips on fuel use to the, the household head or receiving like positive words uh, of uh, encouragement uh, upon cooking with ICS. Another uh, possible solution would be to provide training directly uh, to uh, the, the domestic workers and upon conclusion, give them uh, certificates or a visible bracelet. Uh, so this would be a way to formally signal their skills and it could also act to increase their, their, their confidence in their ability to use the stove, given that as is, they have limited possibilities to experiment with it. Okay, so just before moving to the findings of the uh, solar home systems, just wanted to provide you with a snapshot of the behavioral barriers and solutions that we uncovered as part of the work that we did in these three countries. So as you can see, there's a number of, uh, of barriers that can impair um, adoption, being it uptake or sustained use. Also a number of solutions that can be, can be tested. Uh, and you can see a few examples on, on the screen with details on the diagnostic notes uh, we've published. Uh, so here I would just highlight another aspect, which is the fact that uh, even though you have quite a lot of barriers, uh, sometimes you can use a given behavioral solution to target more than one. Uh, for instance, uh, simplification, uh, like making easier tracking the, the, the spending with fuel, uh, could be a way to tackle uh, bandwidth constraints when it, when it comes to actually uh, computing how much you, you, you spend with these like small purchases of uh, uh, small and repeated purchases of fuel, inattention towards savings, uh, or even uh, realizing the, the grinding benefits uh, of uh, shifting to, uh, to the ICS to tackle present bias. And I'll leave it here and I'll pass to Sam for the solar home system findings. Thank you. All right, thanks, Joanna. So let me just move back one slide. So um, I'll be discussing the findings from field work in Ethiopia and Uganda and remote work from uh, Senegal with a focus on Uganda where our target demographic was uh, refugee settlements. So um, in Uganda, we first conducted quantitative uh, um, analysis before we went to the field using some great uh, existing administrative data set. Uh, just one really simple um, descriptive to highlight is that over 90% of refugees are lacking access to energy and that there's a high, and what we discovered in our field work is that there's a high danger to collecting firewood, especially um, in Changwali and, um, and around the host and refugee communities as forest rangers are there to protect uh, the forest from deforestation. Um, and there's a, um, there is a, a, a dangerous dynamic there. Um, so this field work was conducted January, 2020, right before COVID hit. Um, we visited Chengwali and this red line is um, the, the areas that we interviewed and conducted uh, marketplace observations. And uh, essentially two main um, settlement regions we visited were in the Southwest Chengwali, which has a mix of earlier and later cohorts of refugees and rhino camp in the West Nile region, which is one of the poorest and least developed regions, um, which is why you see over 60% of the respondents in rhino camp reported receiving income assistance from World Food Program. So some of the topics covered in the household interviews um, focused around community norms uh, and perceptions of solar home systems individual preferences and beliefs, mindsets, values, and behavior when it comes to experience with solar home systems, um, savings and loans, especially when it comes to energy use for lighting and solar home systems, and inter-household decision-making amongst uh, many others. Um, before we get into the user journey and behavioral bottlenecks, I just want to highlight a quote that 
captures um, a lot of what we heard across all three uh, countries, Ethiopia, Senegal, and Uganda. Almost everyone thinks it is necessary to have a solar home system. If we had the necessary financial means, we would all have one at home. They tell us that the solar home system have revolutionized their lives. So what this quote captures is that solar home systems are seen as aspirational. Um, and they're seen especially as an improvement in the quality of living standards. However, um, learning and saving up to purchase a solar home system involves a complex set of decisions, uh, each subject to a variety of challenges that must be at least considered, if not overcome, when designing a successful program. So this infographic builds on the qualitative research across the three countries, but essentially illustrating the journey map of Bull and Adeo's family uh, towards the adoption of a solar home system. So we'll just walk through a first few steps. So in the first step, they need to become interested. Um, given the first quote I just showed you, you may think, okay, well then they're all, all is good. They just wanna jump on it and they're interested and in, uh, wanting to purchase. However, um, uh, they, there's a lot of mental models regarding poor quality of products um, due to counterfeits, as you see in the quote below. Poor quality products are flooding the market. The only problem is that they frequent, the batteries frequently deteriorate every six months. So especially if you don't buy a certified product, you're not guaranteed um, warranty nor maintenance. And the counterfeit products uh, especially break down over a few months. And uh, what makes what compounds this to make it even more difficult for um, for the household when you know investing in a solar home system is that the products are of not counterfeit versus non counterfeit are very hard to discern. So this is an SHS supplier who is trying to show us uh, draw us the difference of internally of the solar panels of a counterfeit versus non counterfeit because it, the difference is actually not discernible to the naked eye. So um, we walked away and we had energy specialists on our team um, who still, we couldn't quite figure out, you know, how to, how to discern the difference even, um, which is, you know, one, uh, one low hanging fruit for behavioral solutions right there. Um, but uh, this just means that it is very difficult to even um, make a choice on a certified product. The other thing to note is that in, um, in recent years, uh, part of the welcome package for refugees um, that UNHCR gives out is a solar lamp. And through our interviews, we learned that these solar lamps break down within a few months. Um, and the uh, households then um, off sometimes go to the marketplace to replace the solar lamp, uh, and then they get a counterfeit. So their first experience in general with solar products is a negative experience. So whether or not they hear negative experience from their peers of um, it breaking down often, or just their personal experience with a very simple solar lantern, um, which isn't enough to power in a household for, for a, a light bulb, um, they, they have these mental models regarding the poor quality of products, especially for what's considered a big investment for them. So imagine that um, you know, there's enough um, successful adopters from trusted and reliable peers in their community that have had good experiences with solar home system. This is permeated uh, through the community, um, through different uh, behavioral strategies. And uh, Adeo and Bull decide, okay, we really want to purchase a solar home system. Um, but then, as a next step, they have to have the funds available. And this is where a lot of behavioral bottlenecks come into play. Um, the first thing to note is that microfinance is not the solution for all. Uh, so as you see in this quote, interest rates are too high, 25%, and I have to repay quickly. I'm afraid I won't be able to honor my commitment. So this is um, seen as a very risky investment uh, from the household side, of course, because the interest rates are extremely high and the repayment periods are between three and five years. And on the MFI side, um, it's considered a risky investment, even though when we sat with them and they showed us our bo their books, the default rate is less than 1%. So 
part of, if not a large driver of this, is um, the lack of salience that solar home systems are a productive use asset. Um, so this also permeates through the community savings loans um, through what I'll be calling later the VSLAs, Village Saving Loan Associations, which have a similar function to SACOs in other regions. Um, they offer lower interest rates such as 5%, but they still don't offer um, loans for solar home systems because they only offer loans for productive use. So we'll get into this for a second. However, there's um, some great uh, evidence that micro savings can have the same impact as micro loans. So especially where micro loans are uncertain, it's very worth considering um, savings habits for micro savings. So here's where we reach the next bottleneck. If you remember the intention action gap that we talked about at the beginning with the small exercise, um, we have a lot of what we call present day bias. So you can see this illustrated in the quote, I live day to day. I sometimes think about putting a little money away for a solar home system. I'm thinking about the ways and means that I could do this. And next year, I really want to have one. I'm going to start putting some money aside once in a while. So I might be able to buy one one day. So um, the, again, this is only getting up to the, the third point in this journey map. So um, you can learn more about this in our diagnostic notes. But I really want to focus on, um, on the uh, relationship with money uh, as it relates to purchasing solar home systems, right? So how can we increase the ability for a day and bold and their family to afford solar home system products? So let's first start from the savings perspective. Um, a good place to start is uh, shifting mindsets. So by what I mean here is fostering socio-emotional skills, such as self-efficacy, which is essentially building self-esteem um, in one's ability to be able to save and be able to save long-term for a goal, um, as well as growth mindset, which is the idea that even if you have setbacks along the way, those aren't failures. Um, it's an opportunity for growth and it's resilience. You get back up on the horse and you keep going. Um, so pairing these with goal setting and planning and simple financial training uh, have had huge effects in our, in our other work. Um, but once you shift your perspective, you often need tools to work with that shifted perspective to actually save your funds, right? So what are some behavioral saving strategies? So here, um, one is a simplified phone expense tracker. Um, and so this, you know, is to explain this a bit better, it's trying to think through spending patterns. The message that solar power can save time and money doesn't always resonate with low income households dealing with resource scarcity and managing competing priorities. However, um, looking at this uh, table, which was average um, cost that we uh, uh, gathered um, across the different marketplaces in the Chengwali mar uh, in the Chengwali settlements, you'll see that the highlights are what's needed for powering a one light bulb in the household. And this comes out to about uh, $14 and change. Um, oh, we need to post it, about $14 and change. Um, so this is about 23% uh, of the monthly income of those in the Rhino camp. 35% of the monthly income of those in the Chengwali um, uh, settlement. Uh, however, if you look at mobile phone charging and you have multiple people in your house, we um, they'll be having to charge their phones at least once per week. If they're not able to access the forest for lighting, um, they will also need an oil lamp and to refill the kerosene uh, often. And then they'll also need flashlights and to refill the batteries. So it's it's difficult when expenses can't easily be tracked in a household with many people and varied expenses coming and going out on phone charging, batteries, candles, and other utilities. So these simple tracking tools can help households understand their current phone and energy expenses and compare it to something that will last them um, long term, such as over a year. Um, Okay, I'm I'm still quite a bit further away. Okay, so anyway, um, Sam, I think I'm sorry, but I think you really need to. We are actually currently about ten. Okay, minutes. 
All I'll right. Schedule. So I'll just I'll just finish not... this one slide and then I'll 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 wrap it all up. Um. So uh, and then so then for savings in terms of having just a lockbox with a key and a purpose label for solar home systems in their house as a um a soft commitment device and mental accounting. So um. While there's very little disposable income, we did interview them and ask if you could put a little money aside each week, how much could you put after um, covering for emergency savings for health, for school books, for kids? And, um, and then they, they did all mention the anchor point of around 500 shillings, which is a low amount. But actually, if you save that every week, you'll be able to afford the solar home system on, with under two years, which is much better than paying a very expensive loan over three to five years. So reminders and monitoring and peer-to-peer and -peer, uh, support will help this long-term saving strategy. So briefly, I just wanna mention this lack of salience um, issue in terms of um, shifting perception uh, on how to, how to make um, people aware that solar home systems are a productive use. So it's important to raise awareness of this entrepreneurial value of solar power and showcase the community, showcase the community members who put it to good use. So a real quick antidote, we were work, we were sitting with the VSLA with one of the VSLAs who were explaining, you know, that they're they're not, they're not providing these loans. Um, and we were we were outside a woman's bar and we saw that she had solar panels. And we asked her when she installed her solar panels, she said a few months ago. Um, and then we asked a few other questions and, you know, have you seen your customers increase? Um, and why do you think that's the case? And she was mentioning, you know, they really like the loud music. They've never had cold beer before. Um, we can stay open later with lights. And then the mindsets and discussions started to shift, realizing that it was a solar home system that was really bringing in the additional profits. And so then the conversation with the VSA, VSLA started to shift about maybe it is a productive use. So this type of um, social norm shifting is, is needed um, and part of what we hope to uh, test. So I won't go into this. You can find this on our website. Um, this is in relation to the cross-country work for our solar home systems. So very briefly, we'll be testing these solutions um, in Rwanda and Uganda using randomized control trials to understand essentially, um, you know, which is the most, which can be most scalable at the lowest cost and highest impact. Um, and where to find us, uh, we have all six diagnostic notes, which are um, the longer versions online at our website below. We have an upcoming MOOC on the Open Learning Campus as part of SMAP's Hidden Side of Energy Access, where you can learn everything from how to diagnose behavioral barriers and design solutions. Um, to testing its impact using RCTs and other methods. And finally, we're releasing a series of blogs. One is out now on the development of climate change series on, on World Bank. So now I will hand it over to Matt, Matt King, who is the manager uh, for the Carbon Initiative for Development Fund. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Joanna. And thank you, everyone, for joining. I'm sorry that you get two giant bald faces on your screen. <laughs> Some so early on the East Coast in the US and uh, good afternoon to everyone else. Um, as Sam mentioned, I am the uh, program manager for the Carbon Initiative for Development Trust Fund at the World Bank in our climate group. We call it CDEV for short. CDEV is a $100 million energy access trust fund. We seek to provide clean technologies in the electricity and cooking space to households who need um, these services the most. Uh, so far to date, we've been able to leverage about $250 million worth of private finance with our purchase of about $75 million worth of uh, emission reductions um, from 13 programs, 12 of which are in Africa. Um, that's a lot. So if you go to ci-dev.org, you can find out more about our trust fund. Um, I'm really happy to be here. As you can see, we have a lot of different partners from within the bank and without the bank which is fitting for these cross-cutting energy access challenges that we face. Um, I do have, uh, uh, well, really quickly, one thing is, so the reason why CDEV is involved is we have asked our colleagues in the energy practice and the poverty practice within Embed to collaborate on 
not just compiling lessons learned and case studies from our engagements in these 13 programs, but actually having tangible and workable lessons learned um, that can be applied readily by practitioners in the field. And so we came up with this work uh, that started off with diagnostic notes and is now moving on to the, the pilot impl implementation phase. Um, we're lucky that we have three colleagues um, from within and outside the bank joining us now to discuss some of this work. I wanna introduce them and then ask them a few questions to get the discussion started. I'm cognizant of time, so I'm gonna to try to limit this to just about 15 or 20 minutes total before uh, I will kind of pivot over to um, some questions that we've gotten from the audience that so we can have about 15 minutes from uh, of some kind of a discussion with Joanna, Sam and our three panelists um, from audience questions and then I'll hand it over to Pirella to, to close up in the final couple. Uh, so we're lucky to have uh, joining us today Yabe, who's a senior energy specialist uh, from the World Bank, um, Julie from the Clean Cooking Alliance, and then representing um, the implementers on the ground, we have our colleague Bernard from Green Light Planet. Um, I do believe we've seen their bios either on the invitation online or we've got some slides coming up. So I'll just jump right into the questions. Uh, the first one I have is for Yabe. What are the efforts being made in the clean cooking space currently to deal with the problem of stove stacking? I know that Joanna mentioned that earlier in Rwanda. And how can the findings from the, the diagnostic, um, these diagnostics be leveraged to behaviorally inform these efforts towards sustained use? Um, and I'm particularly interested in regard to cultural norms around, around cooking and how the benefits of clean cooking are valued. This also touches on a couple of audience questions that we've had. So Yabe, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Matt. And, and thank you also for the excellent uh, presentation. It's a great pleasure to work with uh, uh, Sam and Joanna closely on this uh, behavior change study. So Matt, on your question. So, I mean, first, I think we do not necessarily consider stove stacking as a problem. So look at our own kitchen, we all stack. And for convenience, for different functions that each device provides. Um, so my colleague Caroline and I recently published a paper and also blog on cook stoves and uh, fuel stacking in Kenya. So the key message is that cook stove and fuel stacking is the norm rather than exception. So instead of seeing it as a problem, let's see it as an opportunity, an opportunity to truly understand users' needs and offer solutions to meet those needs. So, um, so designing a cook stove that was Bounce to all different individual tastes and preference could be challenging. Um, however, some general design solution can be developed. Um, for example, that uh, um, cooking solutions could come with multi burners, adjustable port rest could be added to stove to accommodate large size pots and high efficiency cooking appliances such as electric pressure cookers can address the need for fast cooking and the need for bulk cooking of grains to save energy. So by better understanding behavior, stacking, um, clean cooking program can be designed in such a way to promote user-centered innovations and solutions for better and more sustainable adoption. I, mean, I want to give example, and which also building on the, the findings from the Rwanda behavior change study. So for the first uh, clean cooking funded uh, co-financed project, um, funded by Clean Cooking Fund. Um, Rwanda Energy Access and Quality Improvement Project, we have uh, designed the results-based financing program to incentivize solutions to address stacking. So households are eligible for incentives to cover either a two-burner device or two one-burner devices. Um, so the, the RBF incentives are also linked to sales and sustained use. And also awareness raising and behavior change campaign, including having local clean cooking ambassadors and cooking demonstration are all important part of the project. And we are also now collaborating with INBA, uh, the behavior change team in design behavior change experiments to find out uh, what interventions are more effective. So I'm particularly keen 
in following through with how we can help change the practice of soaking beans before cooking that Joanna also uh, highlighted. So because this is what I do at home, um, uh, we, we, this I consider is a low cost and effective measures, but how we can really change from um, not practicing this become a new norm and this is really the value and power of behavior science. Yeah. Thank you, Yabe, and I think you're right. I think one thing for the audience to also keep in mind is the, the, the transition from the diagnostics to the pilots, these are not taking place on their own. We've linked them up with um, World Bank operations, also the co-financing from SMAP and CDEV as well on the ground for results-based finance so that we're trying to integrate the different pieces of the puzzle and how behavior change can fit in with some of these fundamental challenges like financing or um, regulatory issues as well. Um, next, I wanna uh, shift over to Julie. I've got a question for you. Um, what are efforts being made by different stakeholders in the clean cooking space to improve the affordability of clean cooking solutions? And how can the findings from the diagnostics that we've talked about today behaviorally inform those efforts to alleviate bottlenecks to purchase of those technologies? Um, and this also aligns with a couple of questions that we got from the audience already about addressing bottlenecks on the consumer and household level versus maybe more systemic bottlenecks. And maybe if you could touch on some of the differences there, if there are any. Julie? Great, yeah, sure. Many thanks for the question and congrats to Sam and Joanna and team on the great work and great presentation today. Um, uh, as I sort of reflected on this question um, in advance, um, I realized that I actually have quite a lot of things to say in terms of you know, different ways that the sector is really making a lot of strides to addressing this affordability question. So um, that felt exciting to me. Uh, so I, I think, you know, there are a couple of ways that we're seeing, um, you know, companies as well as um, donors like the World Bank trying to address um, this issue. So, uh, of course, we're seeing uh, approaches at financing these types of products. So, um, you know, this means in the end, the consumers are still bearing the full cost of, you know, a new stove or transition to a fuel, but we're able to spread that cost over time. Um, you know, a, Obvious example of this is uh, the sort of emerging um, models around pay as you go, uh, which are typically, um, you know, uh, used for gas fuels, both LPG as well as biogas, and increasingly uh, companies are looking at how this could be used for electric cooking as well. Um, and these involve the use of smart meters that um, allow companies to monitor the flow of fuel usage over time, and then um, allow customers to pay incrementally. Um, according to their their cooking and fuel needs. Um, so, you know, lots of emerging um, approaches there uh, that are super exciting to see. Um, and then another emerging model we're seeing um, specifically for LPG is a fractional refill model, which allows uh, customers to um, fill up an LPG canister um, partially. So instead of having to bear the cost of uh, filling up a, a canister in full, they're able to do a fractional model. So again, getting at this sort of big barrier we have where people don't necessarily have the funds um, to, to purchase some of these um, expensive items up front, like a stove or a full canister of, of a fuel like LPG. Um, and then of course, on the ethanol side, we have the Cocoa Networks fuel ATM models. Again, um, an attempt to solve for this issue of sort of uh, you know, being able to spread the cost of, of fuel over time. Um, so these are all really fuel focused models, but of course we still have to find ways to uh, finance or support the cost of, of stoves as well. So um, within these models and beyond, we have seen a number of ways um, that companies have attempted uh, to, to solve for this. Um, we have the savings models um, very much in line with, with what, uh, Sam had talked about of, of using SACOs and other sort of the existing saving models to help people save for these products over time. Um, and then of course we have loan models um, such as layaway, lease to own, et cetera. So um, yeah, I, I think there's been a lot of sort of, uh, you know, testing over time and different approaches that have been used. So it's super exciting to see 
um, that these are actually going to be put against a sort of rigorous um, uh, randomized control trial to sort of test out which ones um, really seem to work and, and respond to consumers. Um, and then sort of on the, on the flip side, uh, you know, beyond sort of financing the products, we're also seeing attempts to actually subsidize the cost through public finance, right? Um, so this is your sort of, uh, sort of typical subsidy program where governments are really just, uh, you know, subsidizing the cost themselves to make them cheaper for lower income consumers. So of course we have a big program going in India and have seen similar programs um, over the years in South America, Indonesia, et cetera. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of innovation there around getting these as targeted as possible to the right people um, and the right segments of the population, which is um, great to see, but I think, uh, you know, can always be an improved and the, the findings from this diag diagnostic can help to support those types of programs as well. Um, of course, another way governments can sort of reduce the cost is through tax exemptions for companies that would ultimately make um, the cost uh, you know, smaller for the end consumers. Um, and then another way we see the sector um, sort of getting, getting at tackling the affordability issue is of course through uh, results-based financing. So, um, you know, this could be carbon finance, um, but increasingly the sector is looking at how can we sort of monetize other impacts and um, get sort of crowd in public and private um, money who are interested in paying for those impacts. So. Obviously, the, the Clean Cooking Fund that Yabe is running at the World Bank is a great example of that. Um, and uh, I'll also say that you know, this was a major recommendation coming out of the um, clean cooking system strategy that, um, that my team and others have been working on over the last year or so. Um, just in that, you know, RBF, there's so much opportunity in RBF. So um, you know, thinking about ways that we can just make that run a bit more smoothly, we can you know, make this a much more attractive sector um, for outcome buyers um, and reduce some of the transactional costs that we all see with those programs. So um, yeah, lots of uh, sort of different ways that have been and are continuing to be tested. And I think the, the diagnostics that were shared today can only serve to strengthen these models and to sort of help to sort of fix the little, the bottlenecks and the the sort of, you know, the ongoing bar barriers that we face within these models. So um, as I said, yeah, it, it, I think there's a lot of exciting work going on and um, yeah, excited to, to get more evidence from the, the trials that the Sam and team are going to run. Thank you, Julie, and I'm glad you brought up the co-benefits. This is another overlapping area in our Venn diagram of collaboration and <laughs> It's um it's good to see that uh, partners such as uh, Clean Cooking Alliance, FNAP, um, and Yabe's team, and 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 us in the climate group are working on on how do we exactly monetize these co-benefits, and this links with the diagnostics and behavior work that so uh, Jam, <laughs> Sam and Joanna, I didn't I just combined their names. That's impressive. No, um, are working on now where. Uh, the perception of these benefits can play into household decision making. So um, another another connection that we can make. Bernard, I'm glad that you're joining us here because you're representing folks actually doing the work on the ground. Um, you know, I think you bring a really valuable perspective, um, and so I'm really keen to hear from you as well. Thank you for joining. The question I have for you is similar uh, to what I asked Julie in that we're talking about some of these foundational program design and implementation challenges, but how do we make the link to interacting with customers? So are the efforts being made to deal with the problem of counterfeit products in the off-grid solar market? Um, and how can we find, how can the findings from the diagnostics be leveraged to behaviorally inform these efforts to tackle those counterfeit products? Um, and I'm particularly interested in the aspect of how do we capture and then regain consumer confidence in these new technologies? How do we help customers overcome negativity bias? Um, and how do we communicate about things like product certification? So Bernard, over to you. Thank you so much, Matthew. And uh, good job, uh, Joanne and Sam. So I think uh, I should just start with to first um, understand that what are the counterfeit products? So these are products that are not um, certified. So these are not your, uh, not your uh, branded products that are being 
are being sold in the market. So for, for example, so I believe we need to start to first understand now, so what are the efforts that are currently um, being made to deal with these um, programs? So, um, for example, I know uh, the first people you need to look at is the government. I think the government needs to make a stand on what kind of products need to enter the particular countries. Then, so, but we also still know that a couple of these products will probably be smuggled into, into the countries. For example, if you look at Uganda, where um, the study by uh, Samantha and Joanne, I, I got to learn that, okay, so whenever the refugees come into this country, they actually give them a solar product. So is it possible like, okay, so a couple of things for them to actually deal with those counterfeit products and for those refugees to know about, okay, these are certified products is for them to be able to communicate um, this kind of products to them when they're giving them uh, the solar products. So while, so the be in form of like a flyer in form of a document or something they get to show to them actually, whenever you're going to be buying your products outside, um, yeah, they, therefore you need to buy products for any of these brands. So I think that's one way which, uh, they could actually start communicating to, um, to, to the refugees. So um, in the past, I also not, I also it's all, also wanted to know that I think uh, the World Bank to the IFC also carried out a, a couple of activations in some or road shows in some certain countries whereby they were able to communicate to, to the masses. So what they did was to work with the branded products, and so they got their products, they took it to the market and showed to the um, to the entire population and say, see. These are the products that we've certified, and through that they can start uh, um, communicating to to one and one another. So um, now, if you look at the diagnostic, and I think uh, delving uh, um, in depth into this, I think of looking at the, the study. So a couple of things which um, that caught my attention, and uh, which I believe is really going to help in this regard is as regards um, first is about product warranties. So I. Yeah, at least I know for some brands or most um, branded products that actually indicate um, the warranties on, on their products. So, but, I, um, but looking at if that's another way in which the masses to start or the people or the consumers get to um, uh, believe that, okay, this, is, uh, this product is actually a genuine product. So maybe we need to lay more emphasis on those warranties. And then um, those brands also need to ensure that uh, whenever there are warranty issues, these are being resolved on time. So they are not being classified as also a counterfeit product because it could be a situation whereby you could be um, a branded product, but because of your technical issues back and you know, talk about uh, your customer service, then um, the, cons the consumers, can uh, that negativity can start coming out. Oh, okay, I think they are all the same. They are all counterfeit products. So that's why um, for the branded names, they need to start working at uh, the back end to ensure that those, those warranties, they live up to their warranty offers. And um, I think that, that will go a long way to start uh, differentiating yourself, um, differentiating the solar brands, um, the genuine one from, from the counterfeit one. So, um, okay, so also I think uh, a couple of things which also need to be looked into and, and from the result of the diagnostic, which is about the brand ambassadors. Uh, so going into local communities uh, and you tend to want to sell those products, trying to, um, try to change the behavior of these, uh, of, of the consumers. Uh, it's pretty difficult for you to sometimes gather people that don't really know you. But if identify one or two people that they're actually familiar with and somebody that they can actually listen to, uh, it's easier for you to be able to make those communication and pass those information through the um, through the entire consumers. So I think th that's one key um, where I, I believe that this could actually be communicated to uh, to the end consumers. So um, so one of those things which you've also noticed as well, like okay, so when it, when you talk to people, people tend to uh, understand what you've said um, in terms of communication. And uh, when you show people some, some things sometimes, yes, they tend to um, capture it. But when people look at the videos or the watch videos, they actually stick to them over a period of time. So when you have these um, successful stories of people that have actually used the product or they're using the product and trying to showcase this to these end consumers. And I think those are, uh, that will actually also assist in, in communicating to them like, hey, these are good products and these, um, these are the products you should opt for if you need to or, uh, buy your solar products. Thank you, Bernard. I'm glad you brought up two things that, that, that I think struck a chord with me is number one is linking 
kind of regulatory and policy support for warranties and creating a, a reliable and confident marketplace with what companies are actually doing on the ground. And indeed, that's one of that was actually probably the impetus for this behavior change work. Uh, CDEV's working with um, the government in Ethiopia to help create a warranty tracking system to help make sure that those warranties are enforced over the long term to help create and sustain this consumer confidence. And we started working with Sam and Joanna and the team, and here we are a couple years later. Um, but I'm also glad that you brought up talking about influencers and those in the community that um, households and decision makers can listen to in making their own purchasing decisions. This was indeed a question we got from the audience, which is, you know, really, how do you see um, social marketing uh, versus behavior change? And in my uninformed view, anyway, it seems like social marketing is a tool that can be used, a behavior change tool that can be used to influence and inform households uh, as they make this decision. So it's, it's good to know that that's being put to use. Um, we have only 20 minutes left in our webinar today, and I want to make sure that Pirella has a few minutes to close. So um, I will pull a couple of questions from the audience. Um, we'll bring in uh, Joanna and Sam again, the JAM team, and um, maybe ask two or three questions. And I'd ask that each of you, when I ask you, just limit the questions to three or four minutes, and I will be mean and cut you off so that we can make sure we have time for, for Pirella. Um, I want to ask, let me see, I've made a list here. Um, I want to start with Julie, actually. Um, there's a question about, you know, what can we do to reach kind of some of the most maybe disempowered and vulnerable groups um, through our outreach. I know that, for example, in the Rwanda diagnostic notes, one of the things that pointed out was, um, you know, house helpers and the challenge that how we, that households have with house helpers with cooking, but maybe that doesn't necessarily reflect the most vulnerable households that we could be reaching. So what can we do to translate these lessons from uh, behavioral change to arguably the households that need, need it most? Julie? Oh, that's always the tough one. Um, and really one of the most important ones, right? Because, um, you know, the, the populations that are hardest to reach um, are sometimes most in need. So uh, really, really tough question. I really don't have the answer. I wish I did. I think we all wish we did. Um, you know, one thing though that, that comes to mind for me always when we think about these populations is that you know, we don't need to sort of reinvent any approaches or engagement necessarily, but should really be looking to sort of other, other ways or other organizations that are already interacting or have in some way supported these populations and, and working through them rather than, you know, always trying to create brand new channels or, you know, sort of brand new ways to reach them, um, you know, because in some cases there's also you know, there's the question of, you know, resource constraints and just, you know, income constraints. But in a lot of cases, um, you know, these populations are, are in quite sort of rural and hard to reach places. So one of the major challenges or barriers that we all have is how do you actually get these products to people? Um, and so I think that's where there's so many opportunities or maybe not so many because there isn't great infrastructure or great ways to reach these populations. But um, I think we should look for those opportunities where we can to sort of piggyback into sort of other initiatives, what other organizations are doing or what governments are doing, right? Um, and their sort of engagement with these populations. Um, uh, and, and I also think that that's where the sort of the subsidy, subsidy side becomes so important. I think, you know, oftentimes we talk a lot about consumer finance and consumer finance is needed, but in some populations, consumer finance is probably not appropriate. It really has to be some form of subsidy, at least um, sort of, you know, early on. So um, yeah, those are a couple of thoughts. But again, it's a really tough question. I think we all wish we had a better answer for it. I'm never going to be asked to moderate another panel again. I start off right off the bat with a really <laughs> challenging question. But Julie, I think you made, you made a really good point. And what's that? It just reminds me of that Steve Jobs quote where I think he said something like, good artists, um, good artists, copy, but great artists steal, something to that effect. And I think it does emphasize the point that in our search for solutions that work, it can be really tempting to try to find the new flashy, shiny thing, when in reality, what works is maybe right underneath our noses, and what we need to do is focus on that and just copy it and replicate it and scale it. And I think that's one of the benefits of the work that we are doing here, which is finding what may be 
right in front of us, but not readily apparent. And then just helping to share that information to help people make their own decisions. And this gets into another question that is, again, I'm never going to be asked back. Um, it's for Joanna and Sam. It's a little bit provocative we got from the audience, but I was thinking it as well. Um, you know, as behavioral economists, uh, Joanna and Sam, like, how do you walk that fine line between being perceived as maybe manipulating individuals and communities to make certain decisions or coming across as, as being seen as lecturing or patronizing versus you know, offering some helpful nudges and doing information sharing. I mean, I don't think this is unique to this work, but maybe something from outsiders looking into behavioral economics in general. And how can you communicate this work in a sensitive and appropriate way that's also impactful? Yeah, it's a great question, and, and I'll start and let uh, Joanna compliment with uh, some more uh, profound uh, profound statements. Um, essentially, you know, the, I mean, you can see different sides of the coin of, you know, what behavioral science can do. I mean, we've seen like Cambridge Analytica on one side. What the behavioral science team at the World Bank does is that it's essentially providing agency to the household. So whether, whether you think they exist or not, there's choice defaults everywhere. So whether you, um, you know, when you're signing a form, when you're enrolling um, in an IRA or not, there's defaults everywhere. Um, so it's about setting the choice architecture up in a way that people can be more informed of their choices and can make their own decisions with better information. So it's about actually putting the agency back into the person as opposed to um, just having these standard status quo defaults. Um, so this work is, is all for that purpose, right? Um, it's, about, it's about like really thinking through how to put that um, power and self-efficacy, that self-belief in themselves that they can save, for example, back into themselves when they've been through some really difficult years getting to that settlement um, and, you know, have, having trouble finding employment, you know, having a difficult time there. So a lot of these types of social emotional skill building is not just tackling like a savings intervention. It's a holistic approach to, um, increasing the well-being overall of how, how they feel, how they function, and how they interact with their community. So, um, and everything is by choice. You know, you, we, we're not forcing anything upon anyone. And the, the types of tools that we provide are not saying you have to save. Even, you know, the, the community savings groups, they don't, um, if you can't save the minimum requirement, either you can't be part of it or they just accept you. But we're not even that, you know, you, you can't be part of it. That, that just is part of our understanding of whether this works or not. Do people want to use a saving strategy? Um, so that's part of our, um, uh, you know, kind of agnostic point of view of when we go in to try these interventions. It's not pushing anything. It's offer, offering these in a very transparent way and building um, their self-worth in the meantime, if that makes sense. And then I'll let Joanna talk. Just a couple minutes, Joanna, please. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I think like what Sam highlighted is, is important in the sense of um, whatever we do in terms of communication or the use of nudges doesn't uh, restrict uh, the, the power of, of choice. It's more in terms of aligning the communication so that it actually um, goes and, and addresses a particular uh, needs or, or requests uh, from the side of, of the user. Thinking, for example, on how complex uh, information about products can be, that can make it very hard in terms of figuring out, for example, what are your benefits in terms of fuel savings or energy savings? So how can we uh, design information so that we also allow it to be processed more easily from the side of the user? I think that's a big add-on of, of what we do. Uh, then I would say that, um, I mean, sometimes there is, um, uh, we move immediately to think on how little tweaks, for example, in terms of communication um, are the behavioral approach, but the behavioral approach is way more than that, as, as, as Sam was, was mentioning. Uh, and thinking, for example, of another aspect, which is uh, loan uh, applications. 
so there's a number of bottlenecks there uh, that can have to do with, for example, the friction to act, to act the complexity of information. Uh, and behavioral can have a definite impact there in terms of making the behavior uh, easier so that not only the people that have more resources or more time are able to get there, uh, but so that they are accessible to, to more people. Uh, and then I would say also leveraging uh, what we know works for so, for example, in refugees, which are like very like scarcity um, uh, environments, we know that, for example, you can help in terms of managing uh, uh, cash flows by breaking down your your budgets into more manageable uh, chunks. Uh, that provides some sort of like almost uh, goal setting to allow you to uh, not face like bigger scarcities because of, uh, of the way the money is managed. So yeah, I'll leave yeah, it there. Thank, thank, thank you, Joanna and Sam. And I, I like the way that you've put it, Samantha, is, is viewing the work as providing and sharing information as they go about making the decisions they're going to make anyway in order to enhance their agency. And I think it's reassuring to know that that's the perspective that you bring to this work to make sure that it's not um, perhaps taking on a different a different tone and approach. So thanks for sharing that. Um, I'm going to go with four minutes left, two questions, one for Yabe and then one for Bernard, and then we'll hand it over to Perella. <laughs> Yeah, Bay, we've had a couple of questions about bean soaking. Um, a couple of audience members have noted that perhaps that's been tried in Kenya uh, for some time and wanted to know, do we know anything about whether or not that's working? And if it is, you know, why hasn't that translated to other, other countries or areas? And if it's not, then why are we still trying it? And if this isn't best for you, then feel free to hand off to someone else on the panel. Just two minutes. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I don't know how it's being tried. I think that's something that um, we all need to find out. And uh, because sometimes that you think it is good and you may not necessarily know the underlying assumptions context. So again, that uh, I think that that's the, the, the beauty and the power of behavior science because we are all humans on one hand, we all fundamentally were saying, we all can all relate to each other. But on the other hand, each one's different, right? So what I think is different from what you think. So in the context of Kenya, it may work, or why it didn't work, it's good to find out. But in the context of Rwanda, and I think that's what we try to find out, to see what are some triggers, some nudges can help um, household users to switch their uh, practice. I think one part I want to pick up on this, how the behavior change can change because I think our work in a way, including behavior change, is to enable and facilitate the self-empowerment. So in the end, it's about the person, their own life. These make best decisions for themselves and will provide information, incentives, nudges, and then that they can have a better life, and not only for themselves, but for their family, for the community, and for the environment. Exactly, and I like that you brought up this human element. Joanna, you mentioned, you know, helping advise and, and, and support refugees to, to, to maybe break up how they're um, budgeting and financing. And I recently got married. I wish you had been there to remind me how to do that so that my now wife and I could have maybe broken up our savings for a wedding in a little bit more effective way. I mean, it's just good to remember that these are things that we all, no matter which side of the table we're sitting on, can help uh, keep in mind in our own day-to-day -day lives. Okay, one final question for you, Bernard, and then I'll hand over to Pirella for closing comments. Um, perhaps could you bring the perspective of a practitioner as a closing thought to all of our colleagues here, particularly Samantha and Joanna, what can we do to make sure that the work that we're doing in these diagnostic notes and these pilot interventions are helpful for those of you actually doing the work on the ground? How can we make sure that we translate the studying work that we're doing here into something that's implementable by folks like yourself. Two minutes, please. Okay, um, thanks. Thanks once again, Matthew. So uh, I, I believe uh, for us to, to do that, that has to do with um, uh, how we communicate to, to the consumers. So at, uh, at the beginning, you know, it was uh, pretty difficult because um, one of our uh, uh, the key factors is to ensure that uh, you provide um, a power supply to um, to the underserved and also uh, 
to, to communities and off-grid communities. Yeah, but um, currently, when you look at the diagnostic study, you can you get to see that people's behavior started changing. So um, if you look at, um, for example, in Senegal, people start preferring that, oh, okay, uh, they need to use um, these devices to charge their mobile phones. So whereas um, at the onset is for us, uh, is for those consumers who actually have power supply. So I think it's not left for, for us um, to, to go back to, to, to the drawing board, um, work, work with Samantha and Joanna and see that, okay, from this, um, the result of the diagnostic, how can we use that to actually execute our, our communication um, strategies going forward? So I'll, we now need to probably be specific to some certain um, um, communities based on, okay, what, what do they really want then? Uh, we can answer, oh, okay, what's going to be something that will um, that will come out uh, on the floor for, for them. So while uh, everything, why we still have to show the, all the features of the solar device because of an SHS, whether it's going to come with radio or it's going to come with, uh, or it's going to come with a TV, we have to show all those features, but we have to now look at, okay, this community in particular, this is what they want, then now to um, now be explicit in our communication materials with them and say, this this comes up for, for them. And I believe um, if, it's, if you continue with um, the study with um, um, Samantha and Joanne, we can be able to pinpoint more of what we can actually communicate to different communities across Africa. Thank you. That's really helpful, Bernard. And Joanna and Sam, I think now you've got some helpful uh, marching orders to take this forward. Um, before I hand it over to Perella, thank you all for joining. Thank you to our discussants for joining and the really helpful insights. And thank you to the audience for really good questions. Um, Pirella, I'll turn it over to you to close things out. Thank you. Thanks very much, Matt. And uh, I suppose I'd like to conclude just simply uh, highlighted how delighted I'm really uh, to have been asked to chair um, this event. So thanks very much to the organizers for asking me. Uh, personally, I'm actually really quite a fan of behavioral science and behavioral interventions. I think they can make, they can make a real difference in uh, in, in the way we do development, the way we actually do policy, and especially in the way we actually impact uh, the countries where we work. And uh, I hope that uh, in particular today, you all uh, as audience, and it's amazing how, much, how big the participation was, I was quite impressed. And I hope that we, we all really uh, sort of learn how important behavioral science could be in moving the needle in this important agenda of adoption, adoption of clear energy in developing countries, but I think more generally. Uh, I also personally, as uh, working on East and Southern Africa, I um, look forward to having the team, the embed team involved more broadly in a development agenda in this area, but I think in other very key uh, topics and issues too. So just to conclude, I really just left with thanking the speakers, uh, Sam and Joanna, but also the, the uh, 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 but also the sorry the, <laughs> the panelists, the people that were joining in. So uh, we have um, Jube from the World Bank, we have Julie from Clean uh, Cooking Alliance, and Bernard from the Green Light Planet, and it was really key to see what our experience has been from your point of view. And I think it's, it was really quite important to see how this analysis was done in the six different countries. I think it, it, I think behavioral science to some extent is quite uh, key in a trying to understand differences across countries because it's really so country specific as opposed to behavioral specific. So I think it, it is a very good application from that point of view. Finally, of course, I'd like to thank Matt for this excellent facilitation and, and all the organizers, uh, including the people that co-sponsor co co this event. I'm now going to pass, I'm not going to finish uh, the event, a closed event. I'm actually going to pass on uh, the uh, floor, well, in this case, the microphone to Julie for information on all the upcoming seminars and other series. And thanks very much to everybody for participating. Great. Thank you so much, Pierrella, and to everyone today. I'm now going to switch hats here um, from being a panelist back to a co organizer. Um, of the webinar series. Um, and just again, thank everyone for their participation today and just give a rapid overview of the, the deck again. But no, um, I, 
<laughs> just give a bit of a preview of uh, upcoming webinars. Again, this is part of a series that we're co-hosting uh, with the World Health Organization as part of the Health and Energy Platform of Action. Um, and we have some webinars coming up uh, in July and into the fall. So please do join us. We'll be looking at cost benefit analyses, um, looking at technologies and the different trade-offs there. Um, also looking at standards in October and then rounding out the year in November, um, discussing the connections between clean cooking and climate um, around COP. So again, many thanks to all the participants, all the speakers um, today, and uh, we will hopefully see you next time. And with that, we'll close.